Hi, good morning everyone. Um, I hope that this uh, finds you well and welcome to our somewhat different um, time for worship on a Sunday morning. I'm sure none of us expected to be here, um, wherever here is, in our homes, uh, in and around about uh, the central uh, belt of Scotland, but here we are. And I just want to welcome you to this time of worship. Um, every week we issue the call um, to worship God, and this week in one sense is uh, no different in that, in that regard. Even if it looks and feels different, even if where we are is not where we would normally be, uh, we still issue this call to worship God. And so let's hear God's call for us this morning to worship him as we gather together. Let every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them say to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and might forever and ever. We draw near this morning to worship God at a time of great change and uncertainty in our everyday lives from the youngest to the oldest but we do so knowing the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is the beginning and the end, the one who is our God, our Rock and our Redeemer, the one who never leaves us nor forsakes us. And so I invite us to um, sing together to praise and to worship our great God, thinking about him, the rock who is higher than all of us and all of our circumstances in Psalm 61. Oh, hear my urgent cry, my God, and listen to my plea. From to praising God and to thanking him for his, his goodness. Let's pray and invite us to take this time to unite together um, in prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you so much that you are the great King, that you are the rock that is higher than us, that you are the one who remains unchanged and you are unchanging. And we praise you and worship you this morning in light of uh, these great truths. We thank you for revealing to us uh, your character. We thank you for giving us your word, which speaks so powerfully and clearly into the situations that we find ourselves in now. Which points us to a living saviour who has triumphed over sin and Satan and death and hell. And Father, we worship you and we bow before you this morning to, to give you the praise and the honour due to your name. Everything around us may change, but Jesus never. And we praise you for that. Father, we recognise that we 
are people who are weak and we are people who have sinned. And Father, we would come to you this morning confessing our sin and our need for you to be the one who saves us, who washes us clean. And so, Father, we come to you and we confess before you our sins. Confess before you the things that we have done wrong, that we have uh, not acted on, those thoughts, those attitudes, which have not been glorifying to you. And we pray, Father, that uh, you would make us well aware that as we come to you to um, seek forgiveness for our sins, as we come in repentance, you are the one who is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins. Because you look to Jesus and not upon us. And for that we give you great thanks. Father, in this time of worship, we pray, would you be pleased to presence yourself by your spirit with each of us, wherever we find ourselves just now? Would you encourage us in your word and would you receive all of the praise and the glory which is due to you from us as your people? Encourage us, we pray, and receive praise from us and teach us your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to uh, invite us to open up our Bibles and uh, look at John's Gospel um, as I was thinking about where to go to this morning to um, share from God's Word. This was the section that um, came to mind. So I invite us to turn to John's Gospel, to chapter 20 of John's Gospel, and I'll read from chapter 20, verse 1 to 23. So we'll read together from... Uh, John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 1 to 23. Let's read them here, God's uh, living and authoritative word. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away, uh, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead, then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stood, stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white uh, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. 
When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray before we turn to hear from God's word together. Father, please, in these next moments, teach us your word. Meet with us as your people and take what is words of a mere man and use them as your living word, uh, a word for your people, a word to encourage, a word to upbuild us, a word to bring glory to yourself. Teach us, we pray, for we as your servants are listening. Amen. As the sun rose in the sky a few days or weeks ago, we probably didn't expect to find ourselves in this sort of situation, did we? Uh, I certainly didn't. Um, The normal patterns of life that uh, we are so used to have been put on hold to a large extent, and there is no clear end to the present situation that we find ourselves in within uh, our nation. Small air droplets containing a virus have exposed the weakness of our economy. It's exposed the limitation of our control and it has also exposed the fragility of human life. In these sorts of times, we can be confused, we can be anxious, we can feel overwhelmed and, let's be honest, wonder what is going to happen, what's going to happen in the the weeks and months that lie ahead. As I was thinking about what to do for this morning, I wanted to take us back to basics back to the place which many of the New Testament writers take us to, back to their uh, proclamation of the gospel and back to that uh, central thing which takes place in time and space and history to encourage the church. And that is the, the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection of the Christ. You see, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the turning point of human history. And what is so wonderful is the way uh, that Jesus announces this great triumph He comes to confused and beleaguered disciples, people who knew him, who walked with him, who loved him. But they were confused and they were challenged and didn't know what was going to happen in the coming weeks of their lives. And so really simply, I want to give us three headings to look at and to pin some thoughts on Um, this morning as we think about this uh, section from God's word. I want us to think of God coming to his people powerfully, um, coming to them personally. And coming to them peacefully. So first of all let's look at it. uh, God coming to us powerfully. If we look at chapter 20 verses 1 to 10. We see that on that first day of the week. um, Many years ago in Jerusalem. The disciples of Jesus found themselves in a place of great uncertainty. Doubtless it had been a very long uh, Sabbath rest for them in light of what they had just uh, experienced over that weekend. The death of their teacher, the death of their friend, uh, the execution of uh, the one that they held in such high regard. But as the sun rises over the eastern edge of the city of Jerusalem that day, uh, shining light across the land that Sunday morning, everything had changed. And that is such a wonderful thing for us. This is the the dawn of the most spectacular day in human history. It is the turning point for human history. And it is also the ground for our present hope as people who know and love uh, Jesus. But it doesn't seem like that at first, does it? Mary gets to the tomb and understandably she is distressed to find it lying open and empty. You can imagine her as she gets there. Here's just another way that Jesus has been shamefully treated in all the midst of the mess of this past weekend. You see that in verses 1 to 2 of chapter 20. Mary comes to Peter and to John to let them know. And they too, like Mary, have been disturbed by this news. They run down to the tomb to see for themselves But they didn't really understand what was happening. 
That's what John tells us, isn't it? In verse 10, he hadn't fully understood that all of this was the power and the purpose of God at work to bring salvation um, to many peoples. But even though they couldn't make complete sense of it, we are told by John that he saw the folded burial garments and he believed that Jesus was alive. Did he understand everything in that moment? Did he grasp everything that had taken place? No, but he believed what he had seen. How unsearchable are the plans and purposes of God? I'm sure many of us are confused. We don't know what is going to happen, but we come this morning to the God who is powerful to take a chaos and death and to transform it into life and glory. For those of us who know and love Jesus, for those of us who follow him, who believe in him, we look once again through that open door, through that uh, rolled away stone and there is no longer a dead body lying in a cold cave. There are folded grave clothes and there is a risen saviour for us um, to look upon. For those of us who are listening this morning, maybe for the very first time, uh, to something uh, being streamed on the internet um, uh, to the very first time of hearing about Jesus and his uh, rising from the dead, can I invite you to uh, do what the disciples do, to pause, to walk into that cave and to, to look at what you see lying there, to read what we have in God's word and to see that there is no body cold and dead lying in that cave but there, there are grave clothes sitting there speaking a powerful word about the power of God at work for you and for me rise, raising Jesus from death. You see we are concerned and rightly so about a virus which is causing great panic and great, uh, great chaos throughout our world. It will affect our lives. It will change the, the shape of our everyday reality. And we are powerless to do anything about it. What we hear from God's word is this. The weakness and humiliation of the cross of Jesus is the place where the most deadly virus in the whole world is destroyed. We rightly have concerns about the coronavirus. But we are encouraged by God's word. In fact, we are commanded by God's word to have an even greater concern for our spiritual and eternal well-being. And so very simply, I ask um, with humility, do you know Jesus? I know that it is a strange time. And I simply want to ask, do you know Jesus? Do you know the one who is powerful and meets with his disciples powerfully, showing that he is no longer dead, but is alive, reigning and ruling. If you don't know Jesus, please um, come and, and, and speak to us, reach out to us, um, contact us through social media streams, pick up the phone, email us, um, get in contact with us and we would be more than happy to speak uh, with you about who Jesus is and to encourage you to know him because he has died to bring life and life in all of its fullness for anyone who would turn, repent, trust, believe and put their faith in him. So first of all, we see that uh, Jesus, um, uh, God reveals himself powerfully to the disciples that very first uh, Sunday. Um, we also see in verses 11 to 18 that he comes uh, personally to the disciples. Now, a few things in life are as good as having deeply rooted friendships uh, whether we are single, whether we are married, we know the joy of this closeness. We have um, friends that we can meet up with. We can chat together um, through messages on the phone. We can share challenges and joys in life. We have been made by God for this sort of personal and relational intimacy. It is one of life's great blessings and one of God's greatest gifts for us. And this is a challenge as we move into this period of social distancing and isolation. Maybe uh, this is the thing which scares you most of all about the current situation that we find ourselves in. Who are you going to speak to? 
Who's going to uh, meet up with you? Who's going to take the time to, to listen to you? Look down at the passage with me. What is so wonderful for us is to see that um, the God who is all powerful is also the Savior who is profoundly personal. We see Mary once again, we meet her once again. And unlike the, the other disciples, Peter and John, she has remained at the tomb. They have gone back to their homes, uh, but she has remained at the tomb. Maybe she's looking for an explanation, or maybe she's looking for someone to uh, show her where the body is, to explain to her what's happened um, to the body of Jesus. But she has still not understood uh, the gospel of God's glory in Jesus. That is why the angels who are present at the tomb, uh, they gently rebuke her. They ask her, why are you crying? Now, they're not there to scold her, but they are there to say to her, the steps that you have taken to um, show that you understand something of what's taking place earlier on in this chapter in verses 1 and 2. Why are you turning back from that? Why are you crying? He is not dead. He is alive. In verse 13. After this encounter with the angels, things change very quickly. Almost immediately, she, uh, Mary perceives that there is someone nearby and uh, she, she turns as she is asked a question by this man. And what's interesting is that she is asked uh, near enough exactly the same question. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? I'm sure just like me, when things are hard, when you experience the moments of confusion, uh, there are mental blanks, there is a fuzzy head and you just can't make sense of what's taking place around about you. And Mary is clearly in this place due to the grief of everything that she has experienced over this past weekend. There has been a whole range of emotions, great pain, grief, torment. Because she has just witnessed and experienced the death of uh, Jesus, the one that she has followed, the one that she has uh, loved. And her response uh, to uh, this question is very simple. In verse 15 she says, Sir, please, can you just tell me where he is? Tell me where he is. I want to know where the body of uh, Jesus is. Isn't it wonderful? That this person that she does not perceive to be Jesus reveals himself so personally. It's so wonderful that Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who uh, is enthroned in the heavens, the one who has made all things and sustains all things by the power of his word, speaks so gently and lovingly to a little person like Mary, who is weak, who is weary, who is sad and who just doesn't know what is happening around about her. Mary. All Jesus needs to say is her name and she knows exactly who it is that is speaking to her. Here is the powerful and the personal God who knows his people by name. Did you see that in verse 16? Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. It's worth pausing here to remind ourselves that Mary, a Hebrew woman, is the first person to hear the Lord and to see him after he has been raised from the dead by the power of God. She would have been someone who was a societal nobody, culturally unimportant, and yet she is precious in the sight of God. And for people like you and me, I don't know about you, but I am not very remarkable um, very normal, um, very unremarkable in many ways. This is a beautiful encouragement. God sees us, God knows us, and God loves us and cares for us, even when things seem all over the shop. Perhaps you have deep concerns this morning, concerns about life and health, concerns about work, and where the finances are going to come from if work uh, ceases or stops in the coming weeks and months. Perhaps you have deep concerns about the spiritual condition and the eternal well-being of people you know and you love. Can I encourage you this morning to remember that your Saviour knows you by name, 
knows them by name and he cares for you deeply as one of his children, one that he has bought at the cost of his own blood and he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. He is present with you, he knows you and he cares for you. You see, we follow the powerful and personal God and this means gladly we are able to walk in his ways. Now, more than ever in the past few generations in Scotland, the Church of Jesus in our uh, nation has been given the opportunity to show care for each other and care for those around about us in our communities. For those who don't yet know Jesus, we have been given an opportunity by God to show love and care, uh, a gospel care, a gospel love um, for those around us and for those in the family of faith. That's why we are pulling together uh, teams, pastoral teams, and pulling together resources to help nourish people spiritually and physically at this difficult time. We may be very scared of being isolated, of not being able to have much contact with other people. And this is why we want to uh, take the time to speak to people regularly, to pray together, to read the Bible together over the phone or on uh, various um video streaming platforms if people are able to access them. We want to encourage each other in these days about uh, being believers in Jesus. I want to say to each of us, when we are tired, when we are frustrated, when we want to just scream because we are frustrated in the isolation, take the time in that moment, step back, pause, when you're about to blow up, when you think that there's not going to be any end to where we find ourselves, remember the personal intimacy of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you and I would invite you um, to take time with him in this moment. He personally wants to take time with each of us as his people, as his children, and I invite us to rest in him, to rest in his word, This isn't some sort of distant ethereal spirituality. I'm saying take time with him in his word and listen to him. Speak more with him and listen more to him than the social media streams that we will access and speak more with him and listen more to him than the news channels uh, that we can listen to. There's an old hymn one that's a favourite of mine which seems to make a lot of sense and and help us as disciples of Jesus to walk personally closely with our God and Saviour at this time. Horatius Bonner wrote this years ago. He said this, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down thy weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Friends, if we know Jesus, here is the call for us at this time. Be those who spend time with him, because he delights to spend time with his people. And for those who don't know Jesus yet, come to him. Come to him if you are weary and worn and sad, and you will find in him a resting place which brings you gladness that you have never yet experienced. Finally, if you look at verses 19 to 23, we see the God who comes to us peacefully, bringing us peace. You can picture this scene, can't you, Um, with the, the disciples. What's going to happen now? What are the authorities going to do to us? We're meant to feel the tension behind that locked door in Jerusalem. We are, we are meant to think, This isn't going to end. What are we going to do? Where are we going to hide? But it's into this situation, this situation of fear and terror, this situation of great challenge that Jesus appears uh, to his people. Here is the God who delights to meet with people when things are, humanly speaking, not going well. And that should be a great encouragement to us. One of the things which is prominent in our culture is the desire to find inner peace, to have a a spiritual life, a spiritual existence which is just filled with this inner calm and this inner sense of peace. To enter into a blissful and tranquil existence um, pretty much every moment of the day. Now, 
were all aware of the, the desire to be able to kick back, to stop and to rest. And I'm not knocking that. I'm not decrying that because that is a beautiful thing. Um, and it is something that is, is good for us. And it is something that God does actually delight to give us at certain moments and times in, in life. But what is even more beautiful about the God of the Bible is that he doesn't say that this sort of blissful, tranquil existence is the precondition for getting to know him or for being a part of his people. Christianity is not some sort of distant, detached spirituality somewhere distant up in the sky. It is um, for us right here in the situation that we find ourselves in. It is being made right with God. It is a peace with God which passes human understanding. It is a, a, a right relationship with him being um, established and restored where we are in a place where we gladly serve his purposes in his world, even at cost to himself. That is what Jesus has been explaining to his disciples all along throughout the, the gospel account. He says to them that if we are to follow him, we are to pick up our cross daily and to walk in his steps. Here is how one missionary from many years ago who was serving in China um, put this. While we do not court danger, we are committed to a life which may involve it. Now, I know that most of you will be sitting saying, well, Martin, I'm not a missionary in China, so that doesn't seem to make sense to me. This is where I would want to say to us, for any of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, we are people who have been committed to a life which may involve danger, which may involve risk, in order to uh, reach out with this gospel of peace with God to those who don't yet know him. As Jesus stands among his disciples, he says the most amazing thing, doesn't he? You see that in verse uh, 19 of chapter 20, on the evening of that first day, of the week the doors were locked because of fear of the Jews, Jesus came, stood among them, and he said to them, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now you could be tempted to say this sounds like the self-fulfilling mystical faith that I was just saying isn't the, the, the point of the, the biblical gospel. But what happens next shines light on why this is not the case. Did you see that? Jesus raises up his hands, he raises up his arms and he pulls back his top to show the nail marks and the spear wound which speak the most wonderful word of peace that any person has ever heard, that there is peace with God through the wounds of Jesus. By his wounds, we have been healed as we come to him in repentance and faith and seek to walk in obedience with him. Did you see that? Jesus doesn't arrive in the upper room chastising his disciples. He's not there berating them saying, look at you bunch of wimps, not having a clue what to do. He comes to them and lovingly preaches the gospel to them, encourages them and he equips them for his purposes through them, for the good of the world and for the glory of his name. He comes and says to them, Look at these wounds on me. These are the wounds which speak peace. These are the wounds which speak a better word than your sin could ever cry out. And because there is peace with God through my death on the cross for you, as the Father has sent me, so now I am sending you. Verse 21 of chapter 20. Friends, everything else around us is in a state of chaos. But we come to the God who has made peace with us by the blood of his cross. Here is the place of our eternal security and our present comfort. That comfort which motivates us to costly service. Service of the risen Christ. Looking to the risen Christ who gives us that beautiful, wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit to live in us, to unite us to him so that we are always with him, present with him. That gift of the Spirit who lives in us as the guarantee of our new life. That gift of the Spirit which guarantees us peace with God now and forever. 
You see, friends, we have been saved by the blood of Jesus. We look to an empty tomb and we see a risen saviour who comes to us and says, peace be with you. We do not court danger and we don't do things which are unwise, but we do seek to be people who are loving. We do seek to be people who are serving at a point of crisis in the lives of those who are around about us. We do seek to be serving those who do not know where to turn at this point and juncture in our society and in our community. We don't court danger. We don't do things which are necessarily unwise, but we do things which are loving in the gospel to make much of Jesus and to care for people's eternal well-being at a time of great challenge. We may not have pictured being here. I certainly didn't picture being here. And it is so strange to speak to a camera uh, on a laptop in my office. But what is so encouraging to know is that our God is sovereign, that he rules and that he reigns, that as surely as Jesus has been raised from the dead, we have a hope which will last all the way through into eternity. And no matter what happens in the chaos, the confusion, the challenges of these coming weeks and months, we can come together as the people of God. We can affirm once again, our God knows us. Our God is perf- our God is powerful. Our God personally knows us. And he comes to us with a message of peace and hope and grace, which is for the good of many people including the upbuilding of us as his people. Friends, be encouraged. And let's take this time to pray now for um, various things and to give thanks to God for his word to us. Our Father and our God, we bow before you. We bow before you because you are the one who has sovereign purposes higher than we can ever understand or imagine. Where we look to the confusion which surrounds us, we we humble ourselves and say, Father, we know that you do work all things for your glory and for the good of those who you have called according to your purposes to know Jesus and to come to salvation in his name. And so, Father, we come now to, to pray and to, to give to you our cares and our concerns, to bring to you uh, those that we know and that we love and to respond to your word. Father, thank you that Jesus is alive, that he is risen from the dead, and that that is our hope and our security for now and forever. And we thank you, Father, that to be called to follow in the footsteps of Christ every day that we live on earth means to pick up our cross daily and to not court danger, but to recognise that our life may very well involve that. And so, Father, we pray that you would equip us, you would grant us um, an enabling by your spirit to um, to serve well those that we know and that we love, those who uh, are part of our church family. That you would uh, use us as your people in wonderful ways to reach out with the gospel of Jesus to many people who don't yet know him in the town of Cumbernauld and in the wider surrounding area. And Father, we ask, please, in your mercy, would you bless uh, the efforts of uh, your people uh, in the reliance of your spirit to bring the gospel and to bring practical care and provision to many around about us in these days. Father, we want to pray about the the current coronavirus situation we find ourselves in and we, we, we cry out to you. We fall before you recognising that we do not have the wisdom or the capacity or the resources to be able to understand everything about the situation we find ourselves in. And we go back to the song that we first sang about the rock who is higher than us. And we fall before you and ask, Father, please uh, grant to us uh, your peace, not as the world gives, but as you graciously give to your people. And Father, we would want to pray for those who are involved in various forms of work and um, serving at this time. Father, for those who are on the front lines of healthcare, 
Father, we ask that you would bless each of them. You would strengthen their hands as they face difficult circumstances, as they deal with um, great challenges about what to do. Father, please give them strength and uh, give them health. And Father, liberate them from uh, the guilt that they will experience about making difficult decisions. Father, we also want to um, pray for those who are uh, involved in research and science, who will be working round the clock, long, hard hours, to look into ways to combat this virus. And we want to pray, Father, bless their efforts and as they research and as they think about these things, Father, may they be aware of the complexity of this virus and see you uh, in the midst of their research. Meet with you, the living God, who loves them and has given himself for them. Father, we want to pray for those who in our own congregation are feeling unwell, who are isolated just now. And we pray, Father, would you um, remind them of the great truth that you are the one who is personal, that you are the God who does not leave us or forsake us, that you are the, the God who walks beside us and talks with us through your word by the power of your spirit daily. And we want to pray, Father, that each of us would know a, a real sense of unity in the bonds of peace as members of your church family at Cumbernauld, even though we are scattered in different places at this time. Strengthen us in that unity, we pray, and uh, bless this church family. May, as a result of uh, this uh, period of distance, may there be a great uh, increase of our love towards each other and our love for you. And Father, we would want to pray in a similar way, that through these unprecedented days, there would be a great outpouring of your spirit to awaken uh, men and women and young people throughout Scotland to come to know and love Jesus, that there would be a great movement of your gospel once again in this nation, so that there would be uh, eternal and lasting joy brought to the lives and to the homes of many people up and down this uh, nation. Father, we do continue to pray for your world and we pray for the many peoples in East Africa and in Southern Asia who are experiencing a great trial and difficulty, not only with the, uh, the inevitable uh, time of this virus beginning to, to sweep over there, but also, Father, for the the, the locust swarms which are affecting uh, crops. Uh, Father, please um, have mercy on that part of the world as well. And Father, we would want to pray for your church in that, that area and in those different nations and peoples. Would they be equipped by you for every good work? Would they be enabled by your spirit to live in such a way that they would announce peace with God, but also, Father, show practical care and love and concern for uh, those who are uh, without hope and without Christ? May they use their resources to bless others around about them. Father, please um, hear us, encourage us, and receive from us the worship uh, that you uh, deserve and that you are due because you are good and the love that you have for us as your people endures forever. And we come to you with our prayers through Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's finish our time of worship and uh, praise together by singing our Wonderful uh, Sam, uh, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. And uh, let's unite in praise together, thinking about the one who doesn't leave us, even though there may be shadows. He is the one who will lead us home and his goodness always follows us. The Lord's my shepherd.
as we finish our time of worship let's hear from God's word now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our saviour through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen Go love your God. Go love your neighbour.